Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? What's up? Today, I'm going to show you how to give your animations that stop motion look. So you can go from this to this. So the first thing we need to talk about are frame rates. A lot of people make their title animations at 30 FPS. I personally do this just because it makes the math a little bit easier when working with expressions. But there are lots of different frame rates. Most shows and movies are at 24 FPS, sometimes 25. A lot of animation is done at 12 frames, but then doubled to 24 FPS for television. What's known as animating on twos, which gives it that cartoon look. In the case of something like Spider-Man Into the Multiverse, they use a combination of those techniques. Stop motion, however, is even slower. It's at between 8 and 12 frames per second. A lot of people just go with 10. So the first question is, how do we get something that's 10 frames per second to play back correctly on something that's like 30 frames per second, like this video? The first way you could do it is just start a new project. Lower the frame rate, and then you could export it out at a lower frame rate, and then bring it into a new project at a higher frame rate. It'll then have the animated look, but then play back at the correct speed. I don't particularly like this method, because if you have to change something, you have to go back in your project, change it, re-export it, bring it back in. That's a lot of work and I'm lazy. A better way is to create a new timeline with different settings. Uncheck the use project settings and lower the frame rate. Then do a render in place, copy that clip to your main timeline, and it'll play back at the correct length but with a lower frame rate. There's just one problem with this method and it's a DaVinci Resolve problem. You can't make custom frame rates. There are only presets and the lowest it goes is 16. Why? Why would you do that? If you're good with 16 FPS, then carry on. I'm not, I want 10 FPS. Now, if you have the Fusion standalone, you can specify a frame rate, just like you can in After Effects. But they don't have a free Fusion standalone anymore. It's bundled with a studio version of Resolve, so it really doesn't help out the free users. And some of you are thinking, isn't there a stop motion effect in Resolve? Yeah, I thought it was just for the studio version, so it wouldn't help you out, but it does appear to work with the free version as well. But it doesn't actually translate into Fusion, so you can't see your changes in real time. So I'm going to show you how to build your own stop motion effect for this. Let's go! Transition! Making this tool is actually pretty simple once you know what you're doing. I'm going to be using two nodes for this, a time stretcher and a custom tool. You could just get away with using a time stretcher, but I like my controls separate. First let's prep the custom tool. By default, you're going to have a bunch of junk turned on. Go to the config page and uncheck everything there. We could use these for our controls, but I'm lazy and I don't like writing number in one blah 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 all the time. Once you've deactivated all the controls, go to settings and save default. You can do this for any node you want. If you make changes to a particular node all the time, just go ahead and save it as a default. That way you don't have to keep doing it. I'm going to hit F2 and rename the node C. This makes expressions shorter. Right click on C and go to edit controls. Now we can add our control in. This is the most important part. What we name the control will also be its ID. You can change the name later, but not the ID. So keep it short, but memorable. Something like frames. Now select control so it shows up on the controls tab. And we'll make a slider from say zero to 10. You can always change it later. Hit okay and you're done. Set the control to three. Now we need to link our control to the time stretcher. I'm gonna change it to nearest and on source time, I'm gonna right click and add an expression. What we want to happen is to have frames repeated for a certain amount of time before the animation moves and then pauses again. In this case, we want 30 FPS to become 10 FPS. So we only need a third of the frames, but those frames will have to repeat three times. So we get back to the full length of the clip. To reduce the amount of frames, I'm gonna take the time and divide by our control, which is c.frames. You can see the name in the bottom left of the screen. This is why I shortened it. Now what we've done is divide each frame by three. That slows the animation down, but it doesn't run the whole length. We only have a third of our animation running. We need to times it by c.frames to get it back to the full length. And of course, dividing and then multiplying by the same thing doesn't make sense. So what we're going to do before that is put our first equation in parentheses and put floor. Here's what's happening. We've reduced the number of frames, making each frame a third, and the floor is rounding the numbers down to the nearest whole number. So frame zero is zero. Frame one is 0.33, which gets rounded down to zero. Frame two is 0.66, which gets rounded down to zero. So for three frames, we're going to see frame zero repeated three times. And I'll do that for frame three, six, nine, etc. Clear as mud? Good. You can now rename C something more useful like control. And you can go back to the edit controls and rename the frames as well. It'll automatically update in the expressions. All right, let's package up this bad boy into something that you can reuse. Select the two nodes, right click, go to macro and create macro. The only things you need to check are input on the time stretcher, output on the control, and frame repeat. Name it and save it as a group. Now you can use it anytime you want. Just open your search bar, look for it, it'll be right there and you can drag and drop it. All right, let's get to animating. 
and a new fusion clip, add in a background to size everything. I like to rename it canvas because everything else is going to go on top of it. You can bring down the alpha if you want. I'm going to switch to one viewer for the moment for your viewing pleasure and to make things easier to see. Now we need an actual background. The first step to making this look photorealistic is to use actual photos. I had a hard time finding a free photo of felt, so I just took some myself. You can download the 2K and 6K versions of these as well as a template for this, but I highly suggest watching this video, otherwise you won't know what you're looking at. I want a blue background, so I'm going to choose something close to blue, like purple. And then I'll use a color corrector node to change the hue slightly. Another option is to use a brightness contrast or another color corrector to desaturate the image first, and then you can change the color to whatever you want. You can always disable nodes to see which one you like better. Now let's add some text. We want to use the text as a mask. There are multiple ways to do this, but I think for simplicity and the best results, I'm going to show you this method. We're going to bring in a texture. I want green, so I'll use yellow. I'll merge this over a background just like we did for our main background. This texture is a little bit bigger than 1920 by 1080. I could use a resize node instead of merging over the background, but I wanted to give you some wiggle room to move this texture around if you need it. And you might be using 4K or 6K, so it makes more sense to do it this way than just try and resize an image. Now just grab a text and plug it into the mask input. Good, and now we have our text and it's cutting out the felt in the shape of our text. But it looks really flat and not really photorealistic right now. Let's fix that. It doesn't really matter if we do the color correction before or after the merge. Quick note, if your felt isn't looking quite right, you can add in a sharpen node to get a more pronounced look. In this case, I've added it in and turned it up to 25, but this isn't always necessary depending on the image and the look you want. The next step is to add some lighting and shadows. This is the most important part because if the lighting is wrong, your animation will always look fake. Let's start with a drop shadow. Reduce the drop distance and change the angle to match the direction we want the light coming from. In this case, I want light coming from the top, so I'll change the direction to 90 degrees so the shadow is downwards. Great, it's already looking more real and it looks like it has some depth. Add another drop shadow and increase the strength and blur. This softens the shadow and gives it a more diffuse look. One other thing we can do to give our text the appearance of depth is to add an emboss node. Okay, it looks bad, but we can fix this pretty easily. Change the emboss style to emboss over and change the angles to 270. Whew, we saved it. It's alive. This will give a slightly highlighted edge on the top. It's subtle, but it helps a lot. The last thing we can do for lighting right now is add a linear shadow to the whole image. So I'm going to add in a black background and a rectangle mask over it. Move the top of the mask to the center of the screen and add some soft edge. Increase the width and height so it doesn't have that weird fall off on the edges. On the merge, drop the blend to something around 0.2. Again, this is a subtle effect, but it really helps to sell it. Now let's go back to our text because it looks too sharp and clean. In reality, you'll have imperfections, so we wanna mirror that here. To do this, we're gonna add our favorite dynamic duo, displace and fast noise. Switch to two viewers and bring fast noise up in viewer one. Bring the contrast down and the scale up to something like 10. The goal is to have a large kind of wavy look, like you didn't quite cut it right with the scissors. Go to displace and change the type to XY. Turn up the refraction a bit and decrease the offset to counteract the position shift. Now we've made it slightly crooked. Play with the fast noise and displace until you have a look that you really want. Now we need to roughen up the edges. Felt is a little bit fuzzy, so the edges need to be a little bit too. Copy and paste the combo and add it in below. The main thing you want to do on these is change the detail and scale of the fast noise. Turn detail up to 10 and scale up to like 300. And you can bring the brightness down to like negative 0.25. This will give some small imperfections on the edge and make it look a little bit fuzzy. Again, you can mess with these however you want. Now that we have the look, let's layer it. Grab the text and all the nodes modifying it and copy and paste it. Merge it in before the original text, so it's on the bottom. Add an erode dilate after the text and make sure the text is going into the yellow input and not the mask input. Increase the amount to around 0.005. Adjust the color, I'm going with yellow, and change the shape so it doesn't exactly match the top text. To do this, go to the first fast noise and change the seethe. Now they don't look exactly the same and it looks like they're actually cut out and put on top of each other. One change I would make to this is to delete the text and replace it with an instance. Grab your main text, hit Ctrl-C to copy, and Ctrl-Shift-V to paste it. Now whenever you change one text, the other will change with it. Lastly, let's add some stitching to it to make it look like these two parts were sewn together. To be perfectly honest, this is the jankiest part of the comp, and it's up to you if you want to use it or not. 
Unlike After Effects, Fusion doesn't have a good way to do this. In After Effects, there is an effect called Vegas that you can easily put on and change your text to a dash line. Now you might be thinking, why don't we just make the outline of our text dash lines and shrink it down with the erode dilate? Well, watch what happens. Because of the order of the operations, the erode just cuts away the lines. Tried numerous methods for this and this is the best solution I could come up with. Make a couple instances of your text. Take the first one and pipe it into a couple erode dilates. Merge them together, change the merge type to exclusive or. Increase the foreground erode all the way up and decrease the background erode slightly. Basically, we just made a mask. Anywhere you see the outline, the text won't show up. And anywhere where it's transparent is where the text will show up. So I'll use the mask on my second text and then I'll just increase the thickness of the lines. Use a color corrector and the other nodes that we used on the previous text. You don't have to go crazy here, just a single set of each should work. You can just copy and paste it from the other text and make adjustments as needed. Adjust it as best you can to fix the corners, and if you have some really weird spots, you can add in a mask to hide it. You will need to keyframe this mask later on with your animation. Now that we have the look, it's time to animate it. First, let's bring in our control from earlier. Add it right before the media out because you want the frame change to happen last. I'm going to rearrange the, my merges a bit and add in a transform. This will just allow me to move the different text layers together in a group and place them wherever I need to. Since we're using instances, my text will change dynamically together so I don't have to worry about that. And it also means that animating one will animate the others. So right click on your main text field and add in a follower. Go to the modifiers tab to see the follower. Let's change the delay between our letters to three. We can change it later. Now let's go to the follower shading tab to animate something for the delay to effect. Go to position, right click and modify with XY path. This will add in a new modifier. Remove any keyframes that might have accidentally been placed by unchecking the diamond. If there are no arrows, then it means that all the keyframes are gone. Go to the frame where you want the animation to end. Let's pick something like 60. Add in a keyframe by clicking on the diamond. Now go to the first frame and increase Y until the text is no longer on the screen. It should add in a keyframe automatically, but if not, click the diamond again. All right, it's a start, but it could be much better. Okay, side note here. You may notice that if you zoom in and look at the letters, because of the way that we've masked the lettering over the felt text, it's actually moving over top of the felt and the felt is not actually moving with the text. This might be noticeable to some people, but if you're using a lower frame rate or using a darker felt look, most people probably won't notice it. This is also a problem in After Effects. There's not really a good workaround unless you're using a background with each individual letter. Right click below the viewers and turn off high quality and motion blur. This will just help Fusion run better as we add in more animation. Okay, now let's change the animation. The letters are moving too uniformly and they stop very abruptly. Click on the text and activate the spline viewer. Make sure it's checked and fit it to the viewer. If you have more than one node show up, click on the three dots and click show only selected. This is the curve of the animation. I'm going to select the end point and I'm going to hit S to smooth it out. Now it'll slow down before it ends. If you get a little hiccup in your animation, it's because Fusion still has part of the previous animation in its memory. You'll run into this from time to time. The easiest way to fix it is to disconnect the nodes that are going into the one that you're viewing, play through the comp, and reconnect the nodes afterwards. Also going to the edit page for a few seconds can help. Change the curve until you like the look. Now let's make the letter drop random instead of in sequence. Go to your follower and change the type to random one by one. It looks okay, but not great. To fix that, change the range to character range and change the last character value. It's looking a lot better, more random, more handmade, but they're also still coming down straight. And moving pieces like this would never be perfect in stop motion. Hit F2 on the XY path and rename it something like drop down. Right click on the X value and modify with a perturb. Rename the perturb to like wiggle X. This is going to give us some random movement in the X direction as the letters fall. Go to the same frame where you ended the animation and add a keyframe to strength. Turn it to zero. We don't want letters shaking after they've already been moved into place. Go back five to 10 frames and change the strength to 0.1. Or you can even go back to the beginning of your animation. It all just depends on how fast you want this action to stop. Go back to the shading tab on the follower modifier and modify Z rotation with the perturb as well. 
Call this wiggle angle or something. Do what you did before, but change the wobble to five and speed to 10. Make the starting strength 20. It looks a little odd, but if you turn on the stop motion effect, it actually looks pretty good. Final tweak we can make to this is the final position of the letterings themselves. You notice that they all sit flat, and we don't want them to look perfectly flat like that. So what we can do is we can go back to our main text, go to the transform, change it from point to path, and then you can go ahead and just draw a path. Move the points around and this will move where your letters are. Make subtle adjustments, but now they're not sitting flat and it looks more realistic. Let me show you the template and point out a few changes and additions that you may want to make. First, I use loader nodes instead of just dragging in the media. You'll probably need to reconnect these if you want them to be working correctly. Just click on the node, click on browse, and search for the texture in the same folder. Once you've done that for all the felt textures and the Resolve logo, everything should be working. Not much should be different from what we went over, but I have two copies of the double layered text we made. I just offset them with that X transform, and I added in a third single layer coming up from the bottom. For that, I just switched the angle of the animation. I use the same timing animation for all of them, but I offset them with a time speed by adding in a delay. So they're delayed by a few seconds, so they don't look like they're all the same. The logo works the same way as the text, but because there's no follower modifier for images, perturbs were put on the transform instead. It functions the same way, but that's where you'll find all the controls. A few final touches, I added a brightness contrast and modified the gain with the perturb to give it a little bit of a flickering effect, which you might have if you're doing stop motion. Maybe you are in the way of the light a little bit or the sun changed. It's subtle, but it helps it. I also added another transform with a perturb to simulate a slight camera shake. I tried just adding in the plain camera shake, but it seems to bypass stop motion control, so I went with the perturb method instead. All right, that sums it up. Let me know if you use this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.